Okay, so this is the Whole Man Academy podcast. My guest today uh, is someone I've been following online for uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say his full name, which is Simon Shlomo Khan. I hope I've pronounced that right, but also known as SK Shlomo. Um, and uh, I was um, how can I put it? We're gonna get onto that, but I was lucky enough to uh, to hear you live in action a, a while ago. Uh, but uh, SK is where do we start? Award winning, record breaking beatboxer, DJ, producer, live looper performed at Glastonbury's, performed at all these different places. There's hundreds of brilliant videos of him killing it on uh, on stage around the world. Um, so, mate, how are you and where are you? Uh, I'm OK. I'm alive. I'm surviving, still breathing, um, which is all, you know, that's, that's all you can ask for at the moment. Um, We're we'll settled for that. I'm at home. Say again? We're we'll settled for, you know, breathing and being alive yeah. at the moment. With And you're, you're, in, yeah. the, uh, you're in the studio. Yeah, I'm at this is my little home setup. Um, yeah, kind of been here quite a long time now, but you know it's cool. Well, um, we're, we're going to get yeah. onto all that because, to state the obvious, it's. Um, I, I was just saying uh, before we start recording. You know, I know, I know a couple of other DJs, and mm. you know, to state the obvious, since what was it March? Not not far off a whole year. Um, you know yeah. that, and so many other industries like this have been have been affected. But so we, we're going to jump into that because I think you know what. We always ask the guys on uh, either, either on Instagram or on our email list or whatever if they've got any questions. And one of them was, you know, about the the effects that this is having on the entire industry of going out. And and actually, I think we first met through um, Hannah White connected us, if I remember, because I then went to see her perform at the Yamaha Studios in Soho. Um, and, mm. uh, you know, she, she's another one I need to get in contact with. But let me take you back to it was March 2019. We were at the. Oslo in Hackney and you invited me down to to um to watch you perform and I was with uh, another guy who just messaged me he's a mate of mine off Instagram um and he's part of the whole man academy and he was like man that was such a that was such a good night um so for you one of the first questions is how did you get into beatboxing well I've been beatboxing since I was small uh when I was eight years old my parents bought me a drum kit for my birthday and about 24 hours later they banned me from practicing it right. <laughs> the neighbors started complaining so i ended up using beatboxing as a way to just like practice rhythm and express myself i didn't really know other people did it until uh, i hit my teens and i realized that it impressed other people and i could get free food at the chip shop late at night yeah. i could make their jaw drop with my beatboxing and it was kind of went from there because that's <laughs> I, I guess when i was young growing up you you for me, beatboxing seemed to be something that was based over in the States and you didn't really see much of it over here. But I was going to ask, at what point did you realise that you were not just, you know, had a bit of a talent for it, but you were, you know, once you started entering competitions or how do you kind of, you know, start to understand how good you were or are? <laughs> well, I think um, at the time, like there wasn't really much happening in the UK at all. Um, I found this website, it was called beatboxing.co.uk and I was like the sixth member to sign up for yeah. or something and there was like a forum on there and uh, they organised, well we organised our very first kind of, the first beatboxing competition in the UK and it happened in 2002, so I was 18 years old and um, the, it was called King of the Jam and the winner was to take home a pot of jam, right. and I'm talking like Bon Maman, like the really yeah. you know, the good stuff and um, so I won the jam. And I was like, oh, I won this, so maybe I should keep going. And then not long after that, I, I moved to Leeds to go and study up in Leeds. Uh, and then, yeah, just kind of being immersed in a, in a, you know, a city with an incredible music scene. Like, yeah, I didn't really do much studying and I just ended up like doing loads and loads of shows and jumping on open mics and stuff. And then I ended up in this band, hip hop group, and we started touring all around the world really quickly from, you know, so by the age of like kind of 19, 20, I was kind of used to you know jumping on a plane going playing at a festival like it, it had become it all happened really quickly was that um because i guess at a young age it's it's an exciting time of life um and that that would lead me on to with with glastonbury i know it's you know it's not like it's just once you've performed at glastonbury so firstly um how many years ago was it you first performed there and because i saw seen the video of you um i'm trying to think who you were performing with um but you know the crowd is I know, 100,000 or so, I, I'm just making it up, but it's so big that you, it, it's, you know, as far as the eye can see. So what was it like when you first played Glastonbury and then moving on to, you know, a enormous kind of crowd like that? 
Well, the first time I played at Glastonbury, um, it was the first festival, like proper festival I've been to in the UK. And it was, uh, it was 2005. And we were playing on some you know, pretty small stage on the Thursday, uh, which meant that I was then free to just like immerse myself in the rest of the festival for the rest of the weekend. Um, and I remember watching the pyramid stage and I swore I would play on that stage. I was like, I'm going to play in that stage. I'm going to give myself five years yeah. to get up on that stage. Um, I was quite ambitious. I was quite kind of driven. Uh, you know, I still am, but um, yeah, uh, I'm, I did it within three years, 2008. <laughs> Exceeded expectations. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it is mad, like getting up on the pyramid stage and just seeing like, yeah, you can't see anything but people, like it is mad. And it's a different um, type of performance. In a way, it's actually kind of, it's, it's kind of, weirdly, it's kind of less intimidating than a, a really small intimate crowd because a really right. small intimate crowd are right up in your face and you feel quite exposed whereas with this this huge crowd it's like they're like one big organism as you don't feel quite <laughs> so like scrutinized um it's really it's a really amazing experience what's it Definitely. like just as you just as you're about to go up there especially when you're in front of that kind of crowd do you you know, um, we're, we've got a couple of other kind of DJs and people that perform, you know, either either sportsmen, you know, in those kind of situations where you always wonder, do you have a, a routine before you go on? Or is it like, you know what, I'm just I'm going to get on there and, uh, and blast it out. Well, these days I do have a bit more of a routine, like I kind of uh, do lots of um, deep breathing. Like these days I've got a whole little routine. I do it's like take a, a set a two minute timer and I just uh, do deep breaths whilst in a power pose. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that TED talk about power poses. It's amazing. But, um, yeah, love yeah, a TED talk. It's, it really, like, it's really empowered me. So if you spend about approximately two minutes in a powerful pose, so it could even just be that, like that's a powerful pose, like just with your posture straight and your, your chest out. Uh, but I tend to do like a lunge or like a stretch or whatever, or whatever I can in the space I'm in. If you do that for two minutes and you just breathe really, really slowly, it, it literally transforms your cognitive um, behavior. It, it, it creates a feeling of like confident well-being, and then yeah. you can go out and do anything. Like I started doing it before important phone calls, or like it's just an amazing, it's an empowering thing to do. I also do loads of vocal warm-ups and just generally kind of just get myself in the right headspace. But you know, back when I first started, I didn't. My routine was just chaos like before a show i'd be like yeah. pacing up and down i'd be like i some I, you know for the really really big shows like the big glass and reason the big you know the ones that really meant a lot to me i'd be i'd be in a pretty bad way if i'm honest right. i'd be really sort of stressed out i'd be I, i'd go missing people wouldn't be able to find me because i'd be kind of <laughs> i didn't really know this at the time but it's yeah you know now i know much more about mental health i was really struggling with anxiety and panic um but at the time, I wouldn't tell anyone that. I'd be like, no, 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 I'm just getting ready. I'm just getting ready. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I used to go and dis I'd disappear. Like, management wouldn't be able to find me before I was supposed to be on stage at Glastonbury. And they'd find me, like, at the back of the tour bus somewhere that I'd, like, hidden away, uh, just basically freaking out, but not letting anyone know. Whereas these days, I'm just much more in tune with all of that. You're, you're more used to it. Because I, I did wonder, it's one of those things where, you know, when you are, um, I was talking to a lady a couple of months ago whose son um, is not, I mean, you could call him a professional footballer, but he's only young. So he's just about moving into that that kind of side of things. But, you know, she said there's a, that big difference between being good at, at whatever you're doing and doing it in front of a few hundred people or and then suddenly you're put on be it a stage or a football stadium where there's, you know, 10, 20, 50,000 people. And, you know, your, your yeah. talent, your talent, your ability hasn't changed, but your ability to kind of, I don't know, cope with that. You know, uh, you know, Pressure. yeah, hundred thousand eyes on you must be must be more interesting. So, what was it like for you when you, um, you know, when you're in front of that sea of people? Are you able yeah. to stay fully present in what you're doing, or do you look around and take those moments where you're like, "Wow, this is cool"? Yeah, like I think, despite um, you know, really struggling with anxiety, but not telling anyone about that. Once you actually get me on the stage and you give me the mic, like it's just, I always had this. I just i just feel like i turn into a different guy it's just like i go into a different world and once i'm there i can i just feel super powerful it's like uh, all of the stuff that i might worry about on a day-to-day -day or like you know any self-doubt any anxiety any kind of um yeah just all, all that stuff in your head that holds you back i once i'm on there i mean you know, i'm not 
going to pretend this happens every single show, but more yeah. often than not, once you give me the mic, once you give me the stage and the, and the light, um, there's a part of me that just le leaps into action and really copes well with that pressure. Um, well, that's... But I think the harder part is when you come back off stage because like that level of kind of superpower isn't, isn't actually sustainable all the time. And yeah. I was really struggling with that, especially when I was younger, because I think people expect that you can be that be that superhero the whole time and i expected that too and i was really down on myself that i couldn't i felt like i tricked everyone felt like i was hiding something and it, it was quite hard well it, that's a good point uh, you know it's all about a superpower because when you uh, you know i've been to uh places like you know in ibiza where you've got um you know thousands of people at space or a schwai or these different ones and, and the festivals where it's like having a, a DJ. It's like people worship them because they're up there on their own and everything that you do, everybody copies. Now, if you, if you clap, they'll clap. If you put your hands in the air, they put your hands in the air. If they make a noise, they make a noise. And it's like, it's like a God. People are worshiping you, especially when you're up in front of everybody. So I wondered for you, it must, it, it must feel like that. But then as you say, to come off stage and you're, you know, you're back to just you, um, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't deal with it very well at first, like, well, for a long time. I just, uh, I used to walk off feeling really sort of this kind of emptiness, like, and I wouldn't even acknowledge it. Definitely wouldn't tell anyone about it, but I wouldn't even really think about it myself. I'd just, um, I'd kind of end up, I'd feel like it was my fault and I'd really punish myself for not being good enough. And the way I'd punish myself is to like work harder, achieve more, like, especially yeah. that moment when I walked off the pyramid stage, because that had been like, that would have been the goal. And I was like, oh, well now what? Like, What's next? That, I thought, I thought after that, I'd be, I wouldn't feel like this. And yet here I am. So then, um, yeah, things got a bit messy. I got into a bit of a bad way, uh, like with you're on tour and there's lots of like, uh, opportunities to misbehave, let's say. Temptations. Um, so I kind of, yeah. And like, I guess I, I didn't really know it was, I wouldn't I, I still wouldn't have used the term like mental health or depression or anything like that but I knew there was a problem so I ended up I quit drinking and I, I sort of cleaned my act up a little bit so I've been completely clean and sober for uh, 12 years now since yeah. 2008 since that summer um but um but I never I still didn't get to the bottom of I, I knew that the alcohol was bad but I didn't really know I I I do you know what I mean? I, I solved the, the symptom, but I didn't solve the cause. And so yeah. that kind of depression and anxiety kind of carried on and, and ended up manifesting in different ways. Basically work, work addiction became a real problem. I just was obsessed, still struggle with it a lot. It's like finding your, if you get thousands of people, thousands of people chanting your name and giving you what this kind of perceived value, it can yeah. be really hard not to find your self-worth there. Yeah. obviously you can't have thousands of people chatting your name every single day um so it can be really dangerous to let yourself worth get tied up in mm. public opinion it's a, it's a really risky business it's taken me a long time to learn that you know i'm a valid human regardless of if anyone chants my name or not <laughs> i mean <laughs> i think that's uh that could be a lesson for a lot of people at the moment i would say that you know having an opinion is one of the most dangerous things at the moment anyway um, but, you know, I wrote on one of our e-letters saying the most important opinion you can have is that of yourself. Um, and as you say, you know, I always take, um, you know, it's a bit like with money, isn't it? If, if people have a lot of money and then they have it taken away from them, sometimes they link their self-worth with their net worth. Um, and that's and that's yeah. equally dangerous. But, yeah, I'm sure that, you know, whether it's also for maybe I guess a DJ has a different shelf life to a, a sportsman because sportsmen pretty much are, you know, the average footballer are, are done by their early thirties, but it's that thing of how do you replicate that feeling of when you're on stage and you've got all these people kind of, as you say, you know, hanging on your every word or your, you know, whether it's DJing or beatboxing. Um, and, mm. and you say, and it, I guess it's balancing out, isn't it? You've got the days where you're up there and in the days when you're, you know, you're in the studio or just living a normal life and how do you kind of how do you balance it out between the two are you are you more into because i know you said when i met you i remember saying oh do you want me to get you a beer and you were like i don't drink and it sounds silly but i was very surprised and very impressed because you know being in that industry of late nights clubs and what have you it's so easy to you see so many djs i know drinking water as well but you know 
drinking and maybe mm. taking drugs. So I was like, wow, I was I was impressed with that. What what was it like to start with to to not be drinking? Because everybody around you pretty much is drinking. Yeah, it was it was pretty pretty weird. Like people people found people found it really hard when I said that I wasn't going to drink. Like because it was a bit like well, people have already got their kind of assessment of what your identity is, and because yeah. I was like pretty heavy into the drinking, it was a bit like. What? what do you mean this is, this is what we do <laughs> and then people see it as a front people see it as a criticism um like if i'm like oh, i'm not drinking they're like well, why like, they're kind of a bit like they kind of feel like maybe you're saying they shouldn't drink and it's like no no you do you i'm not like, <laughs> i have no problem with, with you doing anything at all it's just a choice that i'm making yeah um and i'm still i'm still going to be with you I'm still going to have fun it's just uh i i i don't i just hate that feeling of not being in control of of yeah. my body or my voice or you know saying things I regret or doing things I regret like I hate that I can't deal with it and I can't deal with that feeling the next day so I was just going to say um, and for you um you often find with people that are creative that you know you, you essentially you don't have a a proper day job where it's a nine to five because you're doing evenings and maybe late nights and you're traveling and I guess therefore you're always out of a routine as such mm, how have yeah, you managed how have you managed just, that side of it well, um, do you know what? This last year has been interesting. It's been the first time I've ever really been this still. Like I had, um, I, I came off the road before for almost two years. And that was when I was really struggling. Uh, my mental health got really bad and I couldn't really work. And that was really, really horrible. Um, but this feels different. Like, yeah, I can't go out and do my work, but um, but it's not it's not because of my mental health this time. And that, yeah. Actually, find, I've actually found it really empowering to be home, to have a routine, to like get out of bed the same time every day. Like I do yoga every morning, and I get to spend time with my family. Like I haven't consistently been home this long at all, and been yeah. well and present to be here. So it's been good. And then in the last, you know, the first half of lockdown, I was really, uh, you know, I did, I tried to do as much as I could online, but I was still kind of holding on. It felt like I was holding my breath for when I was allowed allowed to go back yeah. out and do do my shows. Uh, but you know the the second half um someone asked me the other day like what what are you doing for work isn't your industry completely shut and i was like oh i'm now a digital artist like that's i noticed that's how i now define myself i identify as a digital artist i go live every single thursday i do all kinds of uh, like shows and keynotes and talks and uh, teaching uh and and all kinds of stuff that i do online you know and it's never it's never going to be the same as as, as you know what I'm normally doing jumping on a plane going around the world and yeah. connecting people in real life but for now and you know at least at the midterm that's who yeah. I, that's who I am and I'm okay with it it's kind of you just have to adapt don't fun. you I think that's yeah that's one of the one of the big things we've you know from a lot of the guys I've talked to on the podcast and they're from a mixture of you know business and formula one and sports and personal development and music all these different things but everybody you know has been affected in some way or another and i think for most people it mm. is that it is that working from home um so how do you mm. had you always had your studio at home or had you did you move everything there when all this happened no i've, I've always had a setup at home like i've i've kind of got I've gone back and forth so many times thinking i thinking you know i should get myself a, a space a premises um you know because maybe it would help with that kind of work-life balance and work addiction if i'd like had a defined time that i go to work to the studio and then come yeah. home so it doesn't kind of interfere in my home life but um but yeah as soon as the pandemic happened i was so glad that i had this set up here because yeah like friends of mine who you know invested all of their energy into into an external studio then weren't allowed to go there and they couldn't work yeah which is so funny because a studio you're on your own anyway <laughs> pretty much yeah exactly exactly it's ridiculous but yeah um i think it's a bit easier now but in that first lockdown you couldn't even go there so yeah i was glad i had this space and then yeah over the last year i've kind of converted this into a it's still a music studio but it's also a broadcast studio so i've got a bunch of kit here green screens yeah. cameras and lights so i can you know do all my streams and do my kind of interactive online events it's so i really enjoy all that it's something i've been meaning yeah. to do for years and it's well like, you've got a bigger reach at least i mean that's that's one way of looking at it isn't it, it it's you know i, I guess yeah you man we're doing streams all around, all around the, world. the world like i go i go live every thursday and i've got this international audience and it's like i'm kind of you know we've had to move this tour back we're, we're about to move it for a fourth time uh, <laughs> which is just exhausting but even the idea like we're looking at i'm looking at all these dates and it's like oh uh 
Newbury or like I don't know uh, all, all these towns on this tour and I'm like but why would I just go to Birmingham why would I only play to those people yeah, like those set of people. what about all my fans in Mexico and India and Australia like <laughs> it does it does open oh, up man. it's a really it's a really good point it opens up that thing now of do you need to travel let's say you're doing I don't know 15 dates around the UK but then it's like do you do those but you live stream them all across the world um and also let's face yeah. it more reach means it's better for business um because you're getting more coverage and more people get to enjoy it so i i know i mean it's uh it's a bit like with our podcast you know when we stopped doing events the events were great but you know you were only impacting the 30 40 50 guys in the room depending on whereas now we know with the podcast it's it's something like 35 different countries that you have people listen to it from um, you know, most of the UK, but I think 15% of them are over in the States. And then there's all these different countries. And you're like, at least like for you going live, it's unlimited amount of people that can hear from SK and, and understand kind of, a, you know, a bit of more of what you're doing. Well, let's ask you about looping then. Um, because, you know, when I was reading, it sounds funny saying a live looper, because some people might not understand what that is. So to, to the man on the street who's uh, listening to this, how would you explain what looping is? Because I love it when you you're... I saw your Zoom, uh, who was it with you the other day, where you asked, you know, like eight people to make a random noise and then you put it all together and uh, and you're like, how does he, how does he do that? And so quickly. <laughs> well, live looping is when you um, kind of record audio uh, and then, so you've got a machine that will record the audio and as soon as you press the button, it will loop it over and over again. So then you're free to add in another layer. So you can have unlimited layers of yourself. It's a great way to kind of have a one human band. Um, so I use it with my beatboxing to kind of layer myself up. But as you say, like I also like to sample the audience. Or, uh, I do it online now. I sample people over Zoom and I put their sound into an, into a track in real time. So it's really, really satisfying to see music kind of rather than going to the studio and spending hours and hours writing a track. I just do it on the fly and it's, it's yeah. got like a mad energy to it. Um, and I started doing that years and years ago uh, in 2000. Four, right I did a session with Bjork yeah uh, and it was the first kind of up until that point I'd only really seen my beatboxing as like a party trick and a way to impress people uh, but she was making this all vocal album and she asked me to come to the studio and make some beats and it was the first time someone had, had asked me to kind of compose using beatboxing and I was like oh I'm, I'm missing a big trick here just kind of copying Snoop Dogg beats or yeah. Jay -Z beats. <laughs> I should be making my own music so I got this looper and it was a really basic one. It was like the, you know, the cheap, you know, I didn't have any money. So it was yeah. the most basic one I could get. And I basically, um, I basically hacked it to shreds. I found all, I, I kind of worked through the manual and, and then I found all the little glitches and bugs and stuff in it that it wasn't even supposed to do. And I kind of turned them into my show. And then uh, a few years later, I became the world first world looping champion, which yeah. I didn't even entered that for a bit of fun. And it's like, I think it's key to have fun. I think like when I, whenever you see someone performing, no matter what they're doing, no matter what the discipline is, if they're enjoying it, if, they're, if you can see their soul kind of expanding whilst they're mm -hmm. performing, it's completely irresistible. So that's why I'm always trying to find what I find to be the most fun and just do that. Don't worry too much about if it's good or if other people like it. Just, just have fun with it. <laughs> well, you, you've just mentioned, fun enough, um, one of the, the next points was about becoming the world looping champion. Um, how, how, yeah. how do you... Um, I was going to say, like, how do you get selected to participate in it? And therefore, and who, what's the process of you becoming the, the world champion? Because that's a, a, a well, feat in I, itself. I had to send in a demo. I had to make a video of myself, uh, just using my looper. Uh, and then that got selected for the UK championships. And then I went to, you know, a, a live event. It was in Birmingham. Uh, won that and then they sent me off to Los Angeles to represent the UK uh, you know with all the different winners from around the world and somehow won that as well so but the thing that really changed was like um, it, it, it gave me a platform and it, yeah and also it, it gave me it kind of gave me a little bit of clout in the world of looping so mm. like all of a sudden I'd have all the different companies who make the kit they were contacting me and saying oh can you can you use our kit and I'd be like yeah, send me all the free yeah, go toys. For it. Yeah, <laughs> but then it got a bit mad because I started trying to. I got. Uh, I wanted it to make. I wanted to make my setup more and more powerful, uh, so I'd end up plugging in more and more of the fixtures kit. But they started to 
they couldn't really cope with just having so many plugged in. Yeah. And in the end, I ended up throwing them all away and just uh, I rebuilt my system from scratch. But I used software this time. I learned how to write software. Yeah. Um, and then created what I now call this machine. Here. It's called Beast, and it's uh, it's essentially really powerful because if you've got an idea, unlike if you buy like a piece of hardware, it can only do what it can do. You can't change how it works. Whereas with software, if you've got an idea, even if even if you can't work out how to do it, you can. There is a way you can, yeah. you can learn how to do that. And that's, so that are you really able exciting. to take that, you are to pick that up and take it with you to events if you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This thing it packs into a case and I take it, I've taken it all around the world. Um, I've seen you, the last year, but... I've seen you doing the, um, the aerial shot of you doing it where you're, you know, you, uh, with, with the looping where you're, um, in fact, you did it in the crowd when I came to see you and, you know, literally put the mic down yeah. and got people to, to, to uh, cause I was like, what, what's going on here? Um, but then once once it all linked up, you're like, oh, this is this is nuts. Well, um, I know you know we here at the Whole Man Academy, um, you know, are the focus on let's say on men, unsurprisingly, and you know mental strength and wellness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We always talk about different stuff, but I think that's one of the the reasons we kind of came into each other's uh, circle of trust, as it were, because I know you said, yeah. and I'm trying to think, it was on your website. I, I wrote it down um, that when you were uh, you resisted becoming a solo recording artist for fear of yeah. because of fear of failure um and you set yourself yeah. that challenge of writing a song every day for a month and after was it five days your your uh, your yeah. brain said I, I need to take a break from this so I, I just wondered can you talk to us about what that was like for you because that sounded like such a great idea but is it is it must take it's taxing to have to try and write a song every day um and, and what was yeah. that like for you well, I don't think the problem was to do with the songwriting. Uh, I mean, it was it was a kind of brutal challenge. It was a bit uh, asking quite a lot of my uh, asking quite a lot of my creative muscles. But the real truth is that I I came off the road. I was like, uh, I've put this off for too long. I want to I want to write this album, and I came off the road. Uh, you know, I I cancelled all the all the shows I had. I cleared out like a whole year in advance because I wanted to do it properly. Um, and I think it was a slightly all or nothing thinking, which, you know, might not have been super helpful, but yeah. I'd given myself this challenge and I'd, I'd given myself, I was like, you have to succeed. I'd kind of given myself, uh, I kind of was treating myself really brutally. Uh, and then, yeah, so the process of, of going from, you know, being on stage a lot to just suddenly not and being yeah. isolated and being by myself and being only with my inner critic as company, <laughs> like that after that fifth day, I just, uh, yeah. I just dropped and my mental health just really, really dropped. And I, to be honest with you, I think I've been holding on for such a long time, uh, trying to avoid falling into a kind of depression hole Yeah. for, for like a decade of just constant distraction, constant, no, I'll just go back on tour, right? Let's do some more shows, right? Let's go bigger. Let's go harder. Yeah. Let's achieve more. Let's make more money. Let's do Natural to do that. Yeah. But I never stopped. So to be honest with you, it wasn't, I don't think it was the music or the, or the the challenge it was just that i finally given myself a break from mm. uh from that distraction uh and yeah the hole i fell in was very 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 hard to get back out of it took me almost two years in fact when that show you're talking about in march 2019 that was when i was just kind of resurfacing that would have been like yeah that was after my first tour that i'd come back so i've probably done about 20 shows by that point so i was feeling much more strong but yeah, that had taken me. That was a really big. That was the day my album came out. So that yes, was a really, correct. Really big day. Yeah, that was the uh, the album launch, wasn't it? Which we will get onto yeah, in that, a second. Yeah, that's a big moment because I'd kind of fallen in this hole, and that 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 particular day signified like a huge empowering step onto the stage and out of the hole, mm. <laughs> and being able to look into the hole and being like, yeah. "Okay, I see you, but I'm not going to jump into you anymore." <laughs> Isn't that important though? And that's I always think that's one of the big things is. You know, you could use that analogy. You you see the hole you were in, and you're like, I'm not getting back in there again. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, slip, slip, can't see the difference between when they're in and out of it, or slip back in very easily. Um, and I yeah. know on your website, one of the things I you'd written was it's empowering stopping trying to control everything around you. Yeah. yeah and yeah, do you yeah, think yeah. that is because you put also because you're creative and you're performing? Is it do you think because you put pressure on yourself to be? producing performing and also providing for the family as well yeah man it's, it's it's a constant struggle like i really struggle with it even now like you know what i mean i go live every thursday and i I, tr I try and do something new every single thursday and it's like that that again it's like pressure on myself and that 
you know no one's gonna die if i don't do it you know what i mean yeah. but i still kind of create this imaginary danger um <laughs> but i think sometimes sometimes I, I get really upset about that and i'm like oh no i'm i'm overdoing it and other times i'm like it's okay that's just that's that's the artistic way like you kind of that's yeah creativity is what it is and like you say that feeling of um of not trying to control everything like I sometimes feel like depression is there's this analogy I feel of like there's this big hole and sometimes it feels like you're just clinging onto the sides the walls mm -hmm. of this giant massive pit of doom and like clinging onto the walls is exhausting and trying to drag yourself up is exhausting and sometimes it's better just to let yourself fall in because you can come back out again you mm -hmm. can like I have done and um you know and I came really close to I, I've talked about this before you know very openly about how I did a TED talk about it, but um, it, I've come back out of it. Lots of other people have come back out of it. So sometimes you've just got to let yourself fall, let yourself mm -hmm. drop, uh, and and see that hopefully it isn't going to kill you. Yeah, well, it's that, hard, man. It might I was going to say that now than it is when you're in it. I always think it's um, you know when people have got these issues, it's sometimes when you look back on it, it seems so much easier than when you're. I would say when you're in the eye of the storm um and yeah. you know i think that's in this last I know, let's call it a year i i, I think mm. it's been tougher for most people than uh, any other time because you've got the isolation the unknown maybe you've got family that are you know don't want to see you or they're because they they watch the mainstream media too much um and all these different issues and i just think it, it yeah literally just before we jumped on and i got the um got the message from Mamoon. i was thinking about that night we first met and that was the surrender album which you it was self-written produced um but the interesting one was it was crowdfunded which i, I remember I, you know i thought that was a great idea because you're not relying on well you're relying on other people the crowdfunding but you're not um you know trying to have just one company and you be beholden to them as it were and con controlled by them if you want to look like that so what was it like doing the crowdfunding process was it was it pretty relaxed or were there moments where you're like fucking hell this isn't going to happen um it's hard definitely hard to kind of go out on your own and not have you know not sign to a label or not have like some bigger force than you uh funding it and making it happen but um it's also really empowering because then you get all the decisions you get all the creativity you can decide how you want it to be yeah without anyone telling you oh it needs to be more radio friendly or whatever you can just do your thing freedom um, but yeah the yeah exactly artistic freedom and i've always been really independent i've always like done it my own way and that has you know sometimes that's held me back other times it's really empowered me um mm -hmm. but yeah the crowdfunding it was it was a real roller coaster at first it was really exciting because you know it was it was a lot because it was the first uh, the day that i launched my crowdfunding campaign for the surrender album was the first day i'd ever told the public that i struggled with my mental health so i yeah. kind of launched this video and it was like I'm making this album to raise mental health awareness uh, and I sort of talked a bit about my lived experience and I've never done that before so that was very 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 scary and very <laughs> I'll bet but it was empowering though it's like because yeah. I started getting messages from people all around the world being like oh my gosh I'm so glad you said that I feel this or I've struggled with that or my fr I lost my friend to this or whatever um, and that was really empowering so I felt very supported and um, you know when we started the, the, the fundraising went up very quickly and I was like this is great uh but then it got a lot harder because that initial whoosh had happened uh and i realized that if i was going to get it from 15 percent to 100 percent, i was going to have to do a lot more yeah and just sort of make one video yeah um and in that time i was actually really really vulnerable because i you know i i still wasn't that used to talking about it and um yeah i mean i talk about this in my ted talk but i kind of uh that's when i got really really bad actually it was during that crowdfunding campaign someone Someone decided to absolutely tr brutally troll me on Twitter, claiming that you know um, depression and suicide are uh, evolution's way of weeding out inadequate men. Um, who <laughs> yeah, are ch to cheers for that. Yeah, and that really, like, I mean, obviously, like, now I can see that person was obviously having an absolute nightmare. That was, I don't know what their story is or what their grief is. Yeah. But it's not anything to do with me. But at the time, I just still was struggling with that kind of inner critic, and um, yeah, that really sent me reeling into a into a dangerous place like because i struggled a lot with suicidal ideation before but this started to become like yeah immediate like red alert health risk yeah 
Um, but because I had been open about it, right, um, my my fans and my friends had started sending me messages every day, just checking in messages, just being like, yeah. hey, man, how are you yeah. doing? Is everything all right? Anything you need to talk about? Uh, and just as I was kind of, you know, really in that red alert place, I just happened to get a message and it was just like, you okay, how's things? And I just was able to unload and talk about it all yeah. and share it and be real. Um, so I don't think, you know, if I hadn't been open about it before that, th those messages wouldn't have been coming in. That support network wouldn't have been there. Mm. And I'm might not nice. be here right now to tell you. Well, you that, so that's crowdfunding, really, yeah, it was hard. Well, that, that's <laughs> yeah, a really important point. It, I think you mentioned when you gave your speech at um, uh, at the at the Alba launch when we met, and and this was an important yeah. point that made me think because you'd said, you know, there's a lot of negatives and positives of social media um yeah. and you know I, I think in the next 5 10 15 20 years maybe we're going to see how the negative effects of people being addicted to it but like i would say with water you know if you drink too much water you'll drown but you need it to live um and i remember yeah. thinking that with you that you'd said you know if you hadn't have had social media and those people reaching out to you that was one of the real positives that you took out of it and and i think you know people need to remember that um at least if you have told someone or anyone about your situation then you've increased your chances of them reaching out to you and you and you talking to someone about it yeah and also the other way around you you're more likely to be able to support somebody else like, mm. i get a lot of uh chances to support other people because people because i've been open about my my depression people know it's okay to talk to me about it and so people reach out to me uh and in, in turn that really really helps my well-being because if i'm having a really hard day but I know that by talking about that to someone else is going to help them feel less alone. That then helps me feel less alone. So yeah, it's a positive cycle. Um, and you know, that, that, in fact, that's what I called the Ted talk. It was called social media saved me from suicide. And like, yep. I didn't want that to sound really clickbaity, but like, um, that's our next because, topic you know I mean? was the Ted talk. So let's, let's, let's get into it. Um, yeah. firstly for you, what was it like when you knew you were going to give a Ted talk? Well, that TED Talk um, was actually the third TED Talk I'd done. So yeah. the actual idea of doing a TED Talk wasn't so scary. But the first two I'd done were about my process, about being an artist. The first one was about being an artist. It was called New Rules. And it was about um, how you can sort of tear up the rule book to be creative. The second TED Talk I did was about technology and about how I've created, you know, how I created Beast and my live looping machine. So those things, although I took them really seriously, they weren't really about like me and my soul. Yes, and my, yeah. So this third one was by far the most terrifying, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I I took it really seriously. Like uh, you know, I spent a lot of time working on it and then and learning it. Like learn, learning your talk is actually the hardest step. Yeah. Um, if you if you give a talk and you use notes uh, or you read it, it just comes off very differently to if you've completely internalised every single word, every single beat, and then you can do it from the heart. So yeah i i road tested the talk at all my shows it was a bit weird I, I came out on tour and i'd be like hey guys uh and i don't think i even said that i think i just started doing the talk it's like a 15 minute talk and i just did this it's a really performative talk like yeah. I, I kind of make the music as i tell the story and after i'd done after i'd done it on tour i was like oh thanks for being my guinea pigs guys that was my <laughs> ted talk that i'm giving in a couple of weeks <laughs> But why not? Meant that by the time it came, like I kind of knew how it would feel to perform it, and yeah, yeah, and it got the standing ovation. It got yeah, it was very emotional. It was, well, I was, was, was going to ask you when it. Um, I only know from doing some public speaking myself that sometimes, just before you're coming to the end, your brain says, "Hey, we're coming to the end, and we've got through it, and you haven't fucked up." Um, so I, I wondered, <laughs> uh, you know, and you haven't, you know, you haven't wet yourself, you haven't, you know, done something, said something, <laughs> said something stupid, um, and so what was it like? when you'd finished it and you get that, you know, you get the ovation, did you feel a sense of like relief that it's over? Um, it was, I remember it being very, very intense. That feeling got the standing ovation. I was like, I was in tears on stage and then I came off stage and then I just froze. I couldn't even go anywhere. I couldn't, I just couldn't do anything. Like I didn't know what to do next. I'd used every little ounce I had. And it was an amazing moment because the, the speaker who was due to come on next, uh, she's in a wheelchair. Um, she's called Hannah Barron Brown. She was giving an amazing talk about, um, you know, about her, what her life had been like. Um, and she saw me stood there by myself on my own, like in tears. And she stood up out of her wheelchair 
to give me a hug. Yeah. She just could see that this human needed a Needs hug at that it. moment. <laughs> and it was honestly, it was, yeah, very, very moving. Um, yeah. I don't think, you know, someone in a wheelchair can't do that very often. So, yeah, yeah that I was very touched by that. And then, you know, by that point, my partner had arrived backstage and she kind of, <laughs> she kind of took me me got me a cup of tea and I was like okay coming back down to earth but like there's yeah certain moments in your life where you really really go somewhere you really really like let let something out yeah um and that can be really hard to do but it's just so empowering um, uh, well, and I haven't really had I've only had a few moments like that in my life that's just gonna say it's one of those where um they're they're, they're priced this moments because um you know they in theory they don't come around very often um, which actually made me laugh because I realized, um, what's your partner's name? Michelle. Michelle. Um, so I spoke to her when I came to see you at, um, in Hackney, but I remember it was so funny because she was standing in front of me and took a photo of you. And I was like, hi, you know, I'm Anthony. She's like, hi. I was like, oh, how do you, how do you know? She's like, oh, he's my partner. And you go, can you imagine standing there going, oh, he's, he's not very good, is he? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? But I ended up, it's funny, out of all the people in the crowd, I, I managed to speak to your partner. She was she was lovely as well, made me feel very welcome. Um, but I was going to ask you, we, I know we've, we've got five minutes left because you're a busy man and you've got people to see and places to go. But um, some of the questions we were asked, um, you know, when I put put who, who we had on was about if you could duet with someone, it doesn't have to be singing, it could be beatboxing. But if there's if there's one artist in the world that you could be on stage with and, you know, collab with, I should say, not duet, because that sounds like... Uh, Joe Cocker and Celine Dion or something but you know who would who would you collab with if there's anybody that's on your list uh, Stevie Wonder no right question. yep straight up yeah absolute hero man because <laughs> just the soundtrack to my kind of musical coming of age and also he saved me from so many like whenever I'm struggling creatively I just stick on like signed sealed delivered or I don't know like any kind of Stevie classic just put that on a full volume and you just can't help feeling that joy like he's just got so much yeah. energy and passion in his music so yeah to get up on stage with him would be that would be the dream <laughs> would be would be that so that's that's the that's the grand plan and also with all the I, I have a feeling i might know the answer to this question but with all the places that you performed what's your favorite I'm, I'm guessing you might say glastonbury but you know who who knows sometimes there can be um like the brixton academy is one of those cool places i've been to and heard djs where it's it's small and it's you know, you can, people are right up close to you. So I just wonder what, what's the, what's the place or, and if, if you weren't allowed to answer Glastonbury, where else would it be? Yeah. I mean, it would be Glastonbury. If I couldn't answer Glastonbury, I'd probably uh, say like, well, fabric was a really big deal. Cause I used yeah. to go there. Like that was my first ever rave. Like I used to go there when I was too young to go there. And yeah. um, so when I got to play there, uh, that was, that was a big deal. Um, but also like just any, any, any opportunity to get up on a stage it doesn't have to be like a big festival, but like any time where you feel like you're connecting with people and resonating with them, it's yeah. just so joyful. I'm really, this talk has made me realize just how much I'm missing it. Like just talk, just then when we were talking about that moment coming off stage at, from the, doing the TED talk, um, has made me realize that, that I haven't really managed to get that feeling of connect. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm really proud of everything we've done with the live streams and we did like a huge event on Ray, uh, on New Year's Eve called Rave to the Moon where we connected people all around the world. Yeah, We've done so many things that have helped the world, but it's really hard to fully understand how that's influencing people if you can't actually be in a space with them. So yeah. no, I, think yeah, that's, I miss that. That's, that's important. Uh, um, Again, I always use football as an example, but I always think back now to, you know, when it's it's quite sad, really, when the guys in the Premier League score a goal and they run to the corner flag and all you hear is. It's horrible. And that's it. It's so sad. And, and you look at, um, I said, there's, you know, two other two other DJs on my radar to, to speak to at some point later this year. And we all know that being in a room like when I met you, the energy in the room, uh, I was going to say it was smoky, but it wasn't necessarily smoky. You know, you've got. The, the lights and the effects and, and all the energy of the crowd and everything. And as we know, it's like us two now, if we were in the studio together, I'd give you a hug at the end and say, it's good to see you. But us, we're both just looking at a screen. So I know it's, we'll, we'll get there yeah. at some well, point. You know um, about the Isle of Man, uh, Isle of Man are completely COVID free. They're allowed to go to the pub. They're allowed to hug strangers. Yep. It's funny that, isn't it? How some places are yeah. completely COVID free and others, uh, we we could do another podcast about that at some point um you know we've got friends we'll get in there, man. We'll get there. Got, got friends in mexico and there's nothing going on there and uh yeah it, interesting times um and we'll i was going to ask man. you um we do our uh, our monthly zoom call with all the guys from the whole man academy and we're always just inviting uh like um 
we've got to, last week's podcast was a guy who's a former like Royal Marine and was in the SBS, you know, special boat service. And um, we always do an hour Zoom call once a month. And I always say to the guys, if at any point you'd, I was just thinking for you, I literally would love to, if you're available, just even if you're on there for like half an hour to explain to the guys and show them how you do looping or something would be, would be cool. Um, we had David love Swan. Who, be fun there. David Swan, the chef, he he cooked, we did a steak night. So all the guys were on the call. Some of them had it in their kitchen and they all either watched him cook a perfect steak because he's worked at, you know, Heston Blumenthal and Gordon Ramsay and stuff. But, you know, it's just different to just a normal Zoom call. So, um, yeah, one, one day when you're free, I know you've got a busy schedule, but we'd love love to. Uh, uh, also, one day when we've actually got a real event, then uh, hopefully we can uh, we can meet up again. Um, and what's your Hit plan up, now? Man. That sounds fun. That's I appreciate. It. What's your um, plan now for the rest? Because it's what's today? Wednesday. It's Wednesday morning. What what have you got on now? And I don't mean clothing wise. It's not one of those shows. <laughs> um, so my life at the moment is kind of juggling like uh, the sort of entrepreneurial side of being an artist. So I've got like a meeting now with a client who's going to commission me to make some creative. Uh, basically, I do a lot of these like lots of like conferences and events where I normally would jump on a plane and do them but now we're doing them remotely and it's fun because I'm kind of finding new ways to do it so that's why I've got to jump off now to get some yep. meeting with that client but um but then yeah the rest of today I've got uh, I've got a live stream tomorrow night uh I don't know when this is going to be going out but tomorrow night I'm live streaming with Imogen Heap who's like right, yep. one of my heroes and um I've got some prep to do for that get my get my setup ready yeah um and yeah it's just juggling that the creative side and the kind of entrepreneurial side like you know booking and moving tour dates yet again yeah. and booking and like all the stuff we've got coming up over the next few the, months the, it's, like, the, it's the constant adjustments of all these things isn't it to be honest um but yeah. uh, right well look i'm gonna let you go because i we we set a time for you to disappear off so you can stretch before your next uh, next appointment but mate i Thank i you, wholeheartedly appreciate your time um and and appreciate you and uh, this this will go out on Friday morning, but I'll send you all the links, and uh, and hopefully we can we can meet up soon when uh, when things have gone back to normal. Amazing! Oh, thanks for having me. It's been lovely to chat. It's a pleasure. Come and come and tune in any Thursday night from eight thirty UK time. I go live every week. Good point. I'll, 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 I'll put it on our uh, put it on our email list as well. All right, brother. Thank you all very right, much, brother. mate. Good all to right, see mate. you. Speak to you soon. Take care. See ya. Bye -bye.